and gentlemen, please welcome on stage Ed Abbo, President and Chief Technology Officer, C3AI, Ark Dobkin, Founder, CEO and Chairman of the Board, EPAM Systems, Jeff Myers, Global Director of Partners and Alliances for Energy and Utilities, Amazon Web Services, Ahmed Rahimi, COO, Katafet Lysa Company, Franca Z Francesca Zarri, Director of Technology, R&D and Digital, ENI, Moderator, Patricia falco Bicali, moderator and former journalist, Falco Global Partners. Well, thanks for staying around. I know it's getting late in the day, but this one is really to the point, action-packed talk about something nobody really understands which is artificial intelligence. So our human intelligence is really starting to get a bit stretched at some time. And I want to kick off this panel with a little story. In my previous life as an anchor for CNBC, my big hero was Larry King from CNN. Okay, shows our generation. <laughs> now, my big hero, apart from my husband, Nani, is Kai Fu Lee. <laughs> <laughs> the oracle of AI. Now, why is he a hero of mine? We are here to talk about the awards and the risks of AI implemented in the diverse industries. Now, this guy has invested, he's a venture capitalist, in about 140 AI, purely AI startups, created over 10 unicorns, companies that are worth more than 1 billion, and a couple of over 10 billion worth. Now, that is the opportunity. That is an award, and that is done fairly quickly. <clears throat> what is the downside? What is the risk? He also says, well, he expects AI to displace about 40% of all global jobs. He says displace. Huh? And that is not only the repetitive blue color, but what we do, white color kind of jobs. And that is kind of daunting. So. That's a little bit risk-reward, putting it a bit into a frame. But to put us, again, on a fairly similar uh, playing field, what is AI? What is the difference between AI, AGI, Gen AI? And no better than to introduce, I think, what it all is. So we kind of start with the same mindset is Ed, of course, head of C3. Tell us a little bit about where we are right now. What is actually artificial intelligence, the difference to machine learning and Gen AI and what we can do with it? Patricia, how much time do we have uh, mm -hmm. to cover this stuff? You know, <laughs> I, I, I stole about three minutes. Uh, but um, before we jump into the generative AI, which is all the talk um, today, uh, it just, it's good to take a step back and really talk about uh, systems today and companies. and. Um, uh, these systems are great tracking systems, and so they can tell you everything with, with uh, hindsight, 2020 vision, hindsight. Um, so you want to know which equipment failed. Um, you want to know how much production there was. Um, you want to know uh, where your supply chain fell apart. Um, that these systems are great for that. AI basically is forward-looking. So we're really using it to make predictions about what's likely to happen in the, in the future. And so now <clears throat> the questions are more, um, which equipment or which compressor or valve is likely to fail in the next number of hours or next number of days, ideally, um, so that I can actually take action and uh, mitigate that uh, failure, whether it's catastrophic or not. Um, where is my production uh, flagging? And what can I do to basically change set points, actually improve production? So that's what we have called traditional AI. So it's really taking existing systems, making them predictive. And there's enormous value in that alone. So you can basically reduce um, downtime, unplanned, unplanned downtime by, we've seen 20, 30, 40% reduction in unplanned downtime. You can improve production by percentage points. Um, as, uh, as Lorenzo said, if you can get another percent or two out of an asset, that's, that's big. And it also uh, can be applied to sustainability to basically improve the, uh, the clean energy footprint. And so what we've done is, with Baker Hughes, built out 
pre-built applications for reliability, for supply chain, for sustainability, for production optimization um, that are readily deployed. So that's traditional AI. Generative is really a fundamental game changer in the human computer um, interface or interaction. And so a lot of you will be relieved that instead of you having to learn SAP <laughs> or a BI dashboard that might or might not have your information, you can now just type in a question to the computer and it gives you um, a response. And that's really a game changer um, because, uh, you know, just to give you an example of that, um, we had one company we were working with that basically had a lot of turnover in their employees, and, uh, and they basically deployed a system to assist with troubleshooting. So they could see something was going wrong, they could ask uh, the generative AI interface, what is it that might be going wrong? The generative AI interface looks at the sensors on the equipment, looks at the operating manuals and guides, reconciles the two and informs the user. So productivity is massive there, and uh, if you read Goldman Sachs, uh, they're, they're actually looking at 7% GDP increase globally. 7% global increase, so it's, yeah. it's big. Yeah, yeah, being a numbers girl, of course, I dug exactly that one up. So PwC, global growth is expected to grow by about 16 trillion US dollars by 2030. That's huge. And actually, the major part in China, 26%. And they are already building quite a bit of infrastructure to become the place to be when it comes to AI, followed by the US that was like 14.5%. So yes, it adds. And I think keywords that Ed mentioned were mentioned this morning as well, and that is efficiency. The technology is here, but the, the efficiency is being basically added through AI, because velocity is exactly another theme that we've been hearing. We need to be faster. We need to be faster in everything, strategizing, implementing, execution, etc. cetera. Um, Ed, on the other hand, I want to ask, uh, you know, there is so much misconception also on a corporate level. And let's keep it a little bit also to, ta to our target audience, which is in the energy sector. You know, we talked about the how to implement the, the transition technologies. And when I walk through the solutions halls, they're like, oh my God, this is huge technology and I'm invested in AI. And I'm thinking, no, no, I like it small and I like it efficient and, you know, numbers game, ones and zeros and what have you. <laughs> how do you really convince you know, this audience that what you bring to the table makes what they see outside really 10 times more efficient. <clears throat> and, I, and Patricia, when I walk through the solution hall, I see AI everywhere, applications of AI everywhere. <laughs> um, well, I think, you know, when we started our partnership with Baker Hughes now about four years ago, there was a lot of discussion about, is this really uh, drive, will it deliver value um, or not? I'd say today, in oil and gas, we've done it. Um, so there are, there are companies that have actually rolled out across all their assets. Um, one in particular that uh, has 28 assets. I, when I say asset, you all know what I mean. They're offshore uh, uh, rigs. They're upstream, midstream, downstream assets, all the way through to refining. And uh, uh, together, with technology and change management have basically driven 5% improvement in uptime. So worth hundreds of millions or billions at the scale that they're operating at. Um, oil and gas isn't alone. We've also deployed these technologies into the um, US Air Force and the Department of Defense uh, at scale. Um, so this is essentially um, anticipating which components are likely to fail on aircraft and pre-positioning parts to the right place at the right time so the aircraft doesn't have to go down for unplanned maintenance so you get higher availability. That's deployed across 5,000 aircraft and 30 different aircraft platforms. Um, so the technology is not the inhibitor today. It's basically go and go fast. Um, I think you'll hear from uh, any and you'll hear from uh, Qatar uh, fertilizer that uh, they've been at it for a few months and um, actually gotten results already. So, and, and we'll hear about that. Let me now bring you, Ark, into the conversation because you are exactly at the forefront when you actually look at a corporation. You walk in and you say, listen, you need to not only digitalize, but you really need to shift in order to be there 
tomorrow to compete not only with your peers, but also with platforms such as, for example, Amazon. They are going to be more and more your competitors. And EPAM are specialized in that. Tell us a little bit about managing that change. And Ed just mentioned change management is not easy, but it's needed. How do you convince? I think, <clears throat> I think the product starting to bring value <clears throat> not right after check is done. And there is a huge implementation efforts usually to bring all integration level to right point. And very often products assume that the state of the infrastructure, IT infrastructure at a certain level, and it's still today, unfortunately, not true. Still relate to cloud situation. It's even more relates to everything what would be happening with the AI which put it additional responsibility and huge efforts to bring this to the necessary quality to have these results. And a lot of human integration and all of this. So it's really a journey and there is a lot of inertia in all of us. And the first reaction is probably not going to work. And a lot of will from the senior management to actually do it, and it's really, really <laughs> very not often happening from the first time. Like any mm -hmm. big enterprise product, you need to consider you started in red status, and then build it. And what we're doing, we actually were helping many hundreds of software companies to build product, and we're learning from them. But at the same time, when you understand this deeply, how technology works, then it's a little bit easier to do implementation because you understand where you need to fix it and not counting just on small configuration and can go to the vendor and solve sometimes things together. Absolutely. And I think it would be a very big part of the, this new technology wave related with AI because we, we saw it from the beginning when Internet was born, we saw it hugely with cloud situations, and now it's another adaptation level. That's why, from one point of view, AI application, like you said, like everywhere, from another, we all need to be patient to see real outcome of this. And a lot of mistakes, what we're thinking right now, application, five years from now, we will think in, that was actually a mistake. Even during the last couple of years, after GNI happened, like reaction was, so it could do this, and then people started to a little bit uh, play with technology, and then some use cases started to die very, very quickly, and the new hope started to happen. Well, that is the big question about AI. Is it a hype? Or is it really, you know, the, the new steam engine, fire, electricity, or whatever? And I think there is a lot of proof that it might not be a hype, but it might be a real enabler. So any technology is both. Sometimes it's, it's hype and reality. And then it depends how you apply this. No, I think, you know, if you look at um, you know, the, the, the knowledge doubling curve, what we've seen, okay, so knowledge doubled in 1900, what, every 100 years, 1945 down to 25 years, since the internet, at least Kurzweil says that, it's like every 12 hours our knowledge doubles. So what is it going to be with AI around? What, is it going to be minutes, seconds? So Jeff, let me turn a very unfair question to you. <laughs> the moment you are there with your partners, yeah. Yep. And, and you as, like, as uh, AWS being the cloud provider, really, and being basically everywhere, omni, omnipresent. You know, the moment you install with your clients, whatever you install, it's out of date. You know, technology will constantly evolve, right? Um, and at Amazon, we're very proud of our history of innovation, right? We started as a company selling books on the internet, and now we do many different things, including videos and devices and you know, all sorts of different technology and innovation. Uh, much of that technology is driven by um, and powered by artificial intelligence and machine learning. So we've actually been in this game, if you will, uh, for more than 20 years, right? When you look at uh, 
I'm, I'm sure many people have purchased something on Amazon.com. If you've seen a product recommendation, that recommendation is, is often generated by an AI algorithm. If you've had a chance to visit one of our fulfillment centers, they run robotics that are powered by AI and, and, and uh, machine learning. Um, recently, we've opened up Amazon Go stores where you can enter the store, pick a product, and leave, and you're automatically you know, billed for that product. Um, that's powered by compu computer vision. It's also uh, tied in with artificial intelligence, machine learning. So you know, we've, we have um, c continuously innovated in our own business. And you know, we're excited about the opportunity to take those innovations that we've had that drive our business and work with our customers and our partners to implement those in a way that's helpful um, you know, for our customers' business as well. Um, I was pretty excited to hear uh, this morning, um, you know, uh, Lorenzo mentioned Lucipa in, in part of his keynote. We announced Lucipa last year here at annual meeting, and um, we you know, are, are, have made a tremendous amount of progress uh, implementing Lucipa, we are, um, it's powered by, again, it, it, Amazon SageMaker technology. So it's AI-driven models that are looking at the way in which assets in the field operate. Um, it's not only providing, you know, as Ed indicated, sort of the predictive analytics, if you will, around uh, what may happen in the future operationally with, that, with those assets, but it's also providing insight and actionable insight about um, how to optimize, how to maintain, you know, how to minimize the, the downtime on those assets to achieve, you know, some of the outcomes, Ed, that you were, that you were referencing. And at the end of the day, Jeff, it's all down to data and real-time capability. Fundamentally, it, yeah, it, it begins with data. All models are built with data. I think what you'll find is that, particularly in an asset-intensive, you know, industry like we operate in, um, I think as we go forward, you'll find that there's going to be a combination of first principles physics-based models coupled with data-driven AI and machine learning models. And then you'll also, as I think as Ed mentioned as well, you'll have generative AI tools that complement both of those and give you very natural language and a, a, a more you know, human-friendly way, let's say, of interfacing with those models and the data that, un, that, that underlie them. Interesting, then also the question about verification, whatever comes out from these models. Um, let me turn it to Ahmed for now, and I loved it because when we talked about um, this panel on the Zoom and we're talking about Ahmed, he said, you know, we're kind of new to this whole thing. We started uh, with AI, and I love him being on the panel because we have like a deep technology expert with Ed, and then we have, you know, one of these companies, Quafco, that is now having to and is venturing into AI. Tell us a little bit about your story a, how, I don't want to say how the idea came about, it's so blah, because everybody knows you have to do it, but you know, how you took the first step and how you managed the change, and if you're already seeing some impact there. Yeah, Kafka journey started more than three years ago. We established Operation Excellence Framework. Before you embark to any uh, AI solution, first you, know, you need to know what do you have. So we did intensive check, and we tried to optimize our process uh, to find out where are the bottlenecks. And then we ended up with a good base that at that time we decided, OK, we reached that level of maturity. And now this is the time of looking for a solution to enhance what we, what we built over the past 50 years. Um, then the question will come from any technology provider to any company, okay, what, what are you looking for? What do you need? Are you looking for efficiency improvement, reliability improvement, additional production? So you as an operator, you should know what you want. And then mm. that life will be much easier on the technology provider to support you and take you to the right direction and implement the solution that you really need. So here also you need to go back and check in your facility if you have the right data. Data, of course, is the fundamental part of any AI implementation. So do you have all the data needed? Do you have all the sensors, all the readings in the right location in your, in your facility? So the more accurate and good data that you have, then the implementation will be much easier and you can see the benefits in in reasonable short period. 
I wouldn't give high expectation, like uh, at that moment that you press the button, you will be getting the production or additional uh, benefit right in the next day. Um, Kafka has seen a good improvement in the, in the, in the, in the first implementation of AI. Um, and that has been in, uh, up and running for the last two months. But there are positive signs there. But I would give it a year to three years to see the full picture of the investment that, mm. uh, that we have done. And now taking you to the, um, managing uh, expectation and uh, many, uh, people management. Um, it's a big change. Mm. Um, everybody would like to work within his comfort zone. So we are taking them to a new way of working. <clears throat> some people will just embark on a new technology and some others will resist and they always prefer to do the way they, they have been doing for the last 10, 15 years. So it's also challenges will come not only with implementation of the project, also with the people around you. And that also will take some time with the right uh, coaching, I would say, mm -hmm. and if people started to see the positive results, definitely they will just shift their mind and cope with, the, with, with this implementation. Let me pick up on one thing you said. Um, we'll have to see, you know, the rewards come a little bit down the line from our investments today, but with that kind of exponential expansion and development of technology today, it's a continuous effort. It's a continuous update. I mean, there doesn't go a couple of days past that we don't have to update one of the devices, whether it's the Aura Ring or our whatever application. Um, so how do you as a corporation really budget for this as well? That you say, okay, this is our you know, investment 1.0, and it's going to continue as long as development continues. Yeah, we, yeah good question and difficult. <laughs> But, uh, yeah, you budget for what you know, and you, break, you have to break your project into phases. So we can say phase one, five to ten years, and that will be the expected budget, and this is the outcome. But as you mentioned, technology moves really fast. And I don't need to finish the first five years if something else evolves and I can see potential, and I, I can always go back and change the strategy and uh, add, remove, uh, scope based on, 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 the, on the available technology at that time. I don't know if I could interject uh, there. What, what we want to do is basically pick high value projects to start with and then deliver them very quickly. Um, you said two months in production, you're already seeing great value. Then use that to fund the next project or the expansion. I mean, that's, that's really the ideal uh, trajectory. Oh. Yeah. Do I get that right? And please correct me if I don't. So basically the efficiency gains you get with the first implementation of whatever technology you put in will make basically the money to then invest to continuous. It will yeah, alter more. support itself. Yeah. Correct. And, and that will make cool. the decision much easier uh, <laughs> that, that, yeah. to approve. If that's I see it's an the easier money, sell as well, reference. right? If, For the entire project. If, 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 if I get to the assumptions that you make in the first <laughs> call, correct. Yeah. That's, that's, that's the way it should, that, that's how we should think about it. And it, it, it's, again, it's a simply a business case. If I yep. see money generated, generating much faster than I expected because of this reason, why not? Absolutely. Just keep going. Get an earlier call at yeah. Francesca. Any. I always called ENI any. Yes. Then I was told off it's ENI. ENI. So okay. I do apologize. Call it as you want. <laughs> ENI, ENI is fine. Jeff already kind of mentioned corporations and AWS and ENI, yeah. you have a corporation going. Tell me where is, especially because we are at this fair, your industry actually, when it comes to AI implementation, seeing the rewards, and where do you see it playing out? So in the last year, we have seen generative AI made, made a radical change in our expectation. Now we are in a hype, we call it a hype, and we see that there is a lot of interest. As a corporate, of course, we have put interest on it, and we try to understand how to deploy in our process. Of course, on the side of a classical AI, before was mentioned, 
uh, of course, the, the predictive AI that we use with the, with the, with the uh, machine learning, mm -hmm. with our models that we also apply with AWS and also with AI, okay? Uh, of course, we do it. Uh, but we are, we are really watching what is going on for the future. So uh, we see the generative AI being applied to different fields, a different domain. We are an energy company, and as an energy company, we have a lot of data. So we have a quantitative data everywhere, but we have a lot also of imaging, a lot of uh, information, information data and semantic data. Mm -hmm. So there is a lot of space for generative AI to be implemented in the, our world. And everywhere there is a converse, conversational team where you have to take some decision based on, for example, summarizing information on um, qualification, on different diff in imaging, synthesizing. Mm -hmm. that, that is a field where we ca you can apply in a very fruitful, fruitful way generative AI. So what we are doing as a company, as a corporate, is to understand these fields and to prepare to the prepare the ground for, for, for this. And I think to the classical field where we are very strong, like, like subsurface, so all the imaging from subsurface, but we are also thinking to future, to the customer, to the, let's say, f f f ENI as a, a pure uh, retail company, energy company, where you have to develop customer experience, for example. So really generative AI, open fields which are different from where we were used to, no? a digital plant or predict, predictive AI for, for uh, rotating machinery or whatever, reliability, etc. That is something known that we are applying since years in our, in our assets in, in a fruitful way with, the, with good results. Now what is the next challenge is to understand how we can, in a fruitful way, an efficient way, apply generative AI. How can we, Ed? Um, it's, it's actually uh, very fast to, um, to apply. And uh, the generative AI is getting uh, more powerful. We used to think about it as for documents and, and images, et cetera. But now you can feed it sensor data, images, documents, um, what they call multimodal uh, data. So Gemini is, you, I think, the it, it's, product. Uh, yeah, it's, right? it's, it's, it's multimodal. And then, um, and then basically start with one area and then continue to expand its scope. Yeah. And so I talked about the case of um, an operator assistance, an operator troubleshooting, where the inexperienced operator can just type a question. I'm experiencing you know, uh, degradation and yield, what can I do about it? Or I want to maintain this piece of equipment, how do I do that? Um, but it gets, it gets very, it can handle very complex uh, questions. Now, you, Patricia, you mentioned something about verifiability of the information. Mm -hmm. And I'd, I'd have two comments on that. Um, one is for the predictive AI, or you call the traditional AI, um, you always have to have what we call an evidence package. So if I'm telling an, an operator that this equipment is likely to fail or this component is likely to fail, I need to tell it why, tell the person why, otherwise they don't believe it. <laughs> so that, that's an evidence package. And then with generative AI, um, it's key that it basically doesn't hallucinate, uh, is the term. And so it's important that the language model basically retrieves information from a dependable source. So that might be your uh, Pi historian, or it might be your SAP syst maintenance system, or um, uh, a, you know, a document. Uh, but it, if it's going to tell you something, it's going to say, I got this from this one or two sources. And uh, you always pick up acronyms when you come to, this, to these events. That, that's called a retrieval augmented generation, a, a RAG architecture for, for generative AI. So, um, so we, that's what we've implemented as a way to basically allow the person to ask a question, the language model to interpret it, and then basically go out and get data from one or more trusted sources. Yes. And then reason over that data to say that the reason that you're having 
yield problems is X, Y, and Z. And here are the sources for the, for the yeah. information. So. It's, um, Jeff, I'll come to you in a, in a yeah, second. I sure. just wanted to quickly comment on that one about hallucination. You know, again, you know, this is, I, I love that because hallucination is really a basic human trait which is nothing else but lying with confidence. <laughs> so, you know, if there is any singularity, we are starting to see already the, the line. Um, at that. So I thought that was an interesting one. So if you get to ChatGPT, by the way, um, it took two months for 100 million users to adopt ChatGPT, okay? The internet was seven years and something. So this is happening and it's happening with everybody. But I think data, data verification, and especially when you only not have, you know, proprietary data you use and analyze to get more efficient, but also the open source and merge those two together. This is where you have to really see your checks and balances, Jeff. Yeah, I was just gonna kind of key off of some of the things Ed was saying. Um, you know, some of our customers tell us that they've got, you know, a lot of very talented people in their organizations that spend upwards of 60% of their time looking for data, right? Yep. So uh, in the fall, actually, we uh, Amazon announced a, a product called Amazon Q, which uh, deployed in an enterprise will connect, it's a Gen AI application that will connect to you know, over 40 different data sources. So think of it as databases and document repositories and things of that nature. Um, and then to Ed's point, you can then, you know, query that, query that set of data for really two, two um, use cases. One is summarization. So it's, you know, Gen AI has proven to be very good at, you know, summarizing documents and yep. summarizing um, reports and things of that nature. Um, and then the second would be um, synthesis. So asking a Gen AI tool like Amazon Q to pull together data from multiple sources. So if you think of it in the context of our industry, you might look at uh, drilling reports, maintenance reports, mud logs, you know, pulling it just from a variety of different data sources, like, like as you mentioned, OSI Pi might even be an example of that as well, to assemble and synthesize, you know, uh, an answer to a question, a prompt uh, that you query through, this, through the mm. tool set. Mark, let me get you back into the conversation. And um, took, me, took me through the process, basically, of trying to really focus in, because this is, this is something that a theme is, but listening to Francesca, listening to the comments here, it seems that AI is kind of needed, useful, at every single level, process, step within an organization, from in to out, right? So how do you, how do you deal with this to say, yes, guys, but let's start here, and then move on to next, if nothing else? Is that coming from you, you know, A, on the advising side, B, also being able to code for your clients, or is it coming from the clients? What, where, is it, where is it coming from? It's clearly both, and clients, some clients know very specific use cases. But I think, I think, even from this conversation, it's kind of obvious AI will change the whole ecosystem of applications. Mm. But, again, today, people still struggling to find what works, what not, and what should be combined from classical applications and not. Or well, like your example that what should be retrieved from SAP versus, I don't know, Salesforce or something else. Or just from some old access file sitting in some corner. Okay, because only this piece knows actually the reality. I think, uh, what we, when we come in, first reaction to death from the majority of the client, how I can even start playing to understand what can I do. And there are already some class of platform which allow very quickly combine uh, kind of commercial LLMs or open source LLMs with proprietary data, starting to build new class of application to do this exactly rack, rack kind of logic, mm. way to take this piece, why is this piece of reliable or not. You started to communicate with clients on these topics and helping to bring kind of relatively abstract use case from reality of the IT infrastructure to something tangible where you can get some result, get some opinion, and then start it to change. So that's, I think, majority of what's happening today. But it's, again, it's a very, very beginning of what's happening. This is exactly like 
for me, this is exactly like Amazon store 20 plus years ago mm. when people were trying to understand what internet can bring. And it was very exciting, but then it's happened to be 0.00001% of what's become possible after Amazon built the first cloud. And that's absolutely amazing. And the level of in innovation which was triggered from them was completely unpredictable. And unpredictable. I, I mean, maybe it was genius who did, but nobody was believing them anyway. Yes, and I think this is so wonderful that you hit on that, Ark, because when we talked, Francesca, you were saying, yeah, but we have to do whatever we do. We need to be a responsible, responsabilità, yeah. ragazzi. Yeah. I mean, it really is important. It is. It is. But how can you be responsible about something that you don't really know where it gets to, goes to? You know, what you... That's the point. And then in our green room, Jeff just said to that point, he said, well, we don't have a crystal ball. We have to make the crystal ball. And you are at the forefront of being the crystal ball. Tell me, what is responsibility in how you implement AI right now? How can you judge what is responsible or not? Where do regulators come into? I mean, we had the case with the New York Times suing chat GPT, you know, intellectual property, don't want to get into it. But can you really legislate the technology or the application or the use? What is responsibility for you? The responsibility of a corporate, and I speak from the side of a corporate that use these tools for doing business, for accelerating the business, for making the business more efficient and more decarbonized. So that is another point that we keep in mind. The, 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 our responsibility is to be aware that we don't know the end of the story, mm. that we are in the middle of a, of a, of a, tri of a, of a, of a trip, of a big journey, and uh, being all the way, all the, all the uh, internally to my corporate, of course, all the disciplines and all the, let's say, the resp internal responsibility that have to do with the, with the use and application of, uh, uh, of uh, AI in our day-by-day uh, -day business, they sit around the table already mm. today. So we have our HR people sitting together with our compliance people, together with the technology people, and already discussing about the, let's say, the use of AI, the reference to which AI, that AI uses for solving the algorithm, and also the way in which people are involved. Because remember that from our side, does not exist AI, artificial AI without natural AI, without having people at the center. The human AI. Yes. The, the human people at the center. So this is very much our, our conscious, our beliefs. Well, that's the basic of good governance. Good and governance best practices from the very the beginning. And from you, the exactly, very from the beginning and you're yes. establishing it. So yes. at that point, you're actually creating the crystal ball in a certain sense. We are creating our crystal ball, yes. Again, we are running out of time and I have a last question to all of you. And let me start with you, Ed, yet again. We're talking about risk and reward of AI in the industrial sector. From where you stand, what's the biggest risk and what's the biggest reward you can see coming up over the next couple of years? Um, I think the biggest risk is uh, not adopting AI for companies. <laughs> I think if you don't adopt and don't go fast, um, I think that was Lorenzo's hard truth number one, scale existing scale, technology scale, scale. fast. I think that mm -hmm. if I took notes, careful notes this morning, uh, is that as the risk is not doing it because you will fall behind and you'll be at a competitive disadvantage. Um, and that, that also is the reward. But um, I think, you know, on the risk side, um, Francesca addressed it very well. You have to put an AI council in place. All the companies we're dealing with have AI councils and they do model reviews. I think financial services took the lead in this and they have a model review process where they review the models and then and then basically put them into production and then continue to uh, review them because it's not a once and, and done thing, so. Ark, very shortly, what do you think? Risk, award? I think about awards, like we talked about it, and it's very simple. From risk point of view, living in today's world, I kind of would generalize it more because the main danger to use it not for right goals. 
and we know how to make falsification. And, and this is beyond technology, it's beyond companies, it's on human level. It's very, very scary to see what might happen if this would be utilized for very wrong purposes. So with you, so with you. And we actually see this. Even without Gen AI participation, how much damage could be done. With this, in bad hands, crazy scary. Mm, Jeff. I think the risks and rewards are a little bit intertwined. I think, from my perspective, the risk of simply deploying technology for the sake of deploying technology and, and forgetting about or, or not paying enough attention to mm. the human aspects of the implementation, I think, uh, for me, that's the risk. Because if you, if, you, if you just implement the technology in the absence of understanding what the change to the business needs to be or the change to human behavior needs to be, you'll likely miss out on the rewards that you would expect to get. Good point. Ahmed? Yeah, uh, the biggest risk, I would say, the, the, the right data, having the right data, the accurate data, mm -hmm. because if you have the wrong input, then you will end up going into a totally different direction and uh, making uh, very bad results. So here, um, special care shall be taken, and that's my personal advice to everybody, to the accuracy of the data, correctness, um, don't rush into finding the solution. Find, uh, define your pathway, identify your roadmap. You shall have a crystal clear vision and target. And with that, it will be much easier for the technology provider to support you to reach you to the target. Francesca, last one. Yeah. And, Yeah, the reward, oh, so of course, I, can, I could see, <laughs> as I mentioned before, there are very positive signs. We are very happy that we have, we have a good start, I have to say. And uh, we are just starting this uh, transformation journey, and hopefully together with our partner, we reach the, the goals. Next year, we'll know more. You come okay. back, you Thank tell you. us. <laughs> Francesca. Oh, to me, it's very important, this panel, because we are together, corporate and our, our ally, allied. So together, uh, together through this uh, path toward the future, but together conscient, conscient that uh, the things are done by people. By, uh, so never forget the human being, which is the... the, the also the final objective of our technology, of our transformation. That we will still exist. Okay. Yeah. Then uh, let me close this panel, the comments, with a fantastic quote from the um, Minister for Artificial Intelligence from the UAE, Omar Sultan al Olama, And he says, there's a few ways you can think about AI. If you embrace it, you're complete. If you reject it, you're finished. And if you ignore it, you're completely finished. <laughs> This is what we are. Thank you so much. Thank you, Thank you as well to everybody. <laughs>